I have to confess at the start of this session that I'm quite fond of the Senate. I'm sure it's not a popular view amongst government or business who want done what they want done when they want it done. But when it functions as it was intended, although not as a state's house because that ship sailed quite a long time ago, but when it's functioning as a house of review, the Senate has a great capacity to knock the rough edges off government policy and produce a better outcome for the people who elected all of them. And what will be in another unpopular admission, I have to say I'm quite fond of crossbenchers because of two interrelated reasons. They have an ability to go beyond the views or the confines of the major parties and they can represent some views that either get lost in the major party process or don't get heard at all. From the larger of the crossbench parties, the Democrats, now the Greens, to the very small, think Ricky Muir, David Linehelm or Nick Xenophon before he had to move to a bigger room for his party meetings than a phone box, they can bring different and often ignored experiences and views into Canberra from the real world or into the parliament. One of the examples is the, and they, and they can be helpful. One of the examples is the Democrats, when they were at the height of their balance of powers, they knocked the rough edges off the GST, off other taxation and Medicare changes in the Labor budget in the early 90s, and worked with the Howard government on 171 amendments, and I'll thank the Parliamentary Library for that bit of research, to pass the Workplace Relations Bill of 96. But there were other times when the government could rely on a single vote. It got the WIC legislation through with the vote of Senator Haradine. Fast forward to 2004, when the Howard government won a Senate majority and passed work choices. Imagine what a different bill that would have been if it had to negotiate that through a crossbench, through a Senate where it wasn't in the major majority. It would have likely been a bill that was more acceptable to the public and less easier to run a scare campaign against. In the end, what happened is work choices helped propel Kevin Rudd into government and the industrial, laws, industrial relations laws were then taken back to the rules that existed before Paul Keating's changes. The Senate crossbench was much maligned by Labor and the coalition governments at the time, and I'll refer to some parliamentary library research again. For 11 years, only 45 of 2,066 government bills were rejected by the non-government parties. They helped get better government legislation through almost all the time, even if it came at an electoral cost for them. Today, and the senators at the table may disagree with me, but I think the story is slightly different. In the last few years, even before 2016, the governments have had a more complex mix of crossbenchers to deal with. And it seems to me that the parties that now come into the parliament, they don't come in to review and improve legislation, but come in with their own mandate that they want to enact whether that be by knocking back legislation that disagrees with their position or insisting on deals and horse trading. For example, spending $40 million on bike paths to, for the Labor Party to get the vote on the second stimulus package. There's nothing wrong with this. Parties are elected for the most part on their policies, although sometimes the minor parties are elected because of, in the past, preference deals or sometimes name recognition. Rarely is their mandate, their policy platform, as wide as the major parties. And I think that uh, the minor parties and crossbenchers, where they may have been from relatively in the centre of government, like the Democrats were, may tend now to come more from the edges of the political spectrum. It's a sign of the fracturing in support for the major parties, something Labor's been dealing with for quite some time now, with the Greens and the Coalition occasionally during the Howard years and now with One Nation and with Senator Bernardi's Australian Conservatives. The complexity of the Senate after the 2016 double dissolution has made things harder for the government, and the complexity within that crossbench group has made for even more uncertainty. One Nation has fractured a little bit, but been put back together with the assistance of the High Court. The Liberals have lost Senator Bernardi to a new party, which swallowed up family first, although not the new Senator, Lucy Gachui, who's an independent for the time being. The magic number the government needs for votes is 39. It needs that to pass legislation. If the Labor or Greens oppose anything, it needs 10 of 12 crossbenchers. It needs both One Nation and Nick Xenophon's team. And even if it gets the Greens, it now needs one extra vote. It's a tough task, but it's not impossible. It's made the job more difficult in an age when politicians shy away from anything controversial, uh, maybe reform shy and risk averse. Government Governments these days will often shelve a controversial proposal long before it gets to the vote. But there are more reasons for that. The poll-driven politics, the media operating at a faster pace, 
and uh, a media that needs to encourage new stories to buy don't help. But it shouldn't be impossible, and just because it's hard isn't a good enough reason to try. The government will be trying over the next few weeks to get its budget through. So we will take a look at that now with our panel, Liberal Democrat Senator David Lionhelm, Green Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, and the leader of the Nick Xenophon team, Nick Xenophon. <laughs> Welcome to you all. I'll kick off this discussion with the question of why are you here? Is it that people are discontented with the major parties? Is it that the major parties are not what they're looking for, or is there another reason? Senator Lionhelm. Well, if you look at voting patterns, uh, the share of the minor parties or the non-major parties, and I include the Greens in the major parties, so the share of the uh, non-major party vote in the Senate has been increasing since 2007. It's now up to about 30%. Um, and. Uh, uh, that if you if you judge you know people's attitudes based on the way they vote uh, it would appear that they are unhappy with what's what they're getting with the major parties so I think the fact that uh, there is a, a, a substantial cross bench uh, is a reflection of uh, of that discontent and as long as people remain discontented with Labor Liberal and and to some extent Greens although the, the Greens would argue about that um, then the minor we, we, we will argue about that. Yeah. The minor party vote will, will remain substantial. Um, I, I think there's probably a combination of things going on here. Um, it, David's right that uh, across the board the support for major parties is, is falling away. I mean, it's now roughly a third of the Australian electorate that votes um, for somebody other than Labor or Liberal. And um, you know, Nick and I from South Australia, I guess it's, um, we started the trend, I reckon, Nick. There's like this kind of view that um, when we were bo both first elected in 2007, there was uh, out of the senators, out of six senators, two Labor, two Liberal, and then Nick Xenophon and I. So it was kind of, um, I, don't, I don't feel like it's um, not normal. I think it's actually very normal. And I'm, I'm quite supportive of the idea that we have more and more voices uh, in the Senate. You, you mentioned in your opening remarks around um, the Senate not being um, in the state's house. Well, I think there's, the, I think we all still come with a view that we do have to represent our, our home electorates as well, um, being our states. But um, I, also, I wanted to take issue with the point around um, wanting to uh, just implement our own policies as opposed to improving and reviewing legislation. I still feel very strongly that that is the primary role um, of the Senate, and as a senator, that's that's my primary focus. Uh, if I can get our policies from the Greens' perspective um, uh, introduced through that process, or policies closer to that, um, then I will. But our job is to be a check on the executive, and um, I think we we do a pretty good job at it. And the more voices, the better. Uh, Australia is. Um, it may it may seem strange, and people want to pretend that um, the, this current Senate is something different. But really, um, it was in the last 30 years. It was that period between 2004 and 2007 that was abnormal, when the coalition controlled both houses. That was strange. What we have now is uh, actually a, a truer and um, more pure reflection of what the Constitution uh, actually envisaged. Linda, just picking up on your um, introduction, you made reference to that period from 2004 to 2007 when work choices went through without any amendment because the government had the numbers and that was really the seeds of, destruction, of the destruction of the Howard government because there was such an effective uh, campaign by unions, by many community groups against the government for that. Sometimes the Senate is there to save a government from itself. Yeah. Uh, and I think that shouldn't be forgotten. And also when um, I'm asked by journalists saying, well, what about the government's mandate? Um, because they, they've got a majority of seats, or they've got a working majority in the House of Representatives. Well, when we go to the ballot box, when we went to, to vote on July the 2nd, seems so long ago, um, <laughs> July the 2nd last year, we actually get two votes. We get the Green uh, House of Reps and the, the much larger Senate ballot paper. So in effect, there are two mandates and there are hundreds of thousands of Australians who vote differently for the upper house compared to the lower house. They actually want that check and balance. And uh, I know uh, David didn't 
uh, approve of the Senate changes, uh, but still got in. And I think he, he gives that alter strong alter alternative voice from his libertarian perspective. And I think that that is, we will disagree with each other, but I think it's a good thing to have that alternative voice uh, along with the Greens and with my team from the political centre. Um, Australians understand that they don't want uh, an executive to behave in an unfettered way. And for instance, the, the deal that was done with the crossbench, uh, but not with the Greens in terms of indexation to get through those package of measures, uh, we actually took the rough edges off that. Uh, we didn't take away thousands of dollars from single parents, which would have, quite been, would have been quite catastrophic in terms of uh, the impact on, on them and their families. Uh, so the um, Senate is there to save a government from itself sometimes. On that question of understanding, I've had the view for a while, although it changed because of the 2010 election and the House of Reps suddenly found itself in a minority and having to negotiate, that House of Representatives members don't really understand how the Senate works, <laughs> and I think probably business even less so. When it, when it comes to the government, a government negotiating with you on a piece of legislation, is there a way they can do it more effectively? than they currently do? Less spin, more facts. <laughs> you know, be, be upfront about um, what it is that they really want to achieve. I think we all take our, and uh, from whatever side of the cross, uh, the political spectrum we come from, I think, on the cross bench, um, you know, I disagree with David on a number of things, but there are other things that I agree with him on, and, and same with, with Nick. Um, but I think it's true to say that we all take our role in scrutinising legislation very seriously. And it is different to being a member in the House where you just kind of get told to, the bell's ringing, you get told to sit on that side of the chamber because that's all, all you can do. In the Senate, you can move amendments, you can actually change the law and improve people's lives. And I think um, if government uh, and business want to engage with the Senate more effectively, you have to understand that we come from a position where we genuinely uh, love legislating. We, we actually like the process of reviewing and improving legislation. We're not there just to grandstand. And um, I think if you, if you come with ideas, if you can come with a, a, a genuine perspective of how you can fix something, uh, I think all of us would be would have our um, doors open to you. Can I just say, I think that the, um, even though he might sound like the Terminator, uh, Matthias Cormann has been uh, the consummate negotiator. Yeah, it took a while for something to get that. Uh, um, the, the, Matthias Cormann has been the go-to person in negotiations for the government. Uh, I found him quite good to deal with. He's pretty tough to deal with, but I actually, and I hope I don't damage his reputation by praising him, but uh, he is actually quite good to deal with. I don't know how others find him, but he's a pretty straight shooter. Uh, uh, and I think the government uh, has been, has found someone that, that deals with the tough issues that seem intractable, and he's he's managed to get some results in respect of that. So I think they've improved. I think the time of the Abbott government, it was kind of take it or leave it. Uh, so there has been an improvement, I think, in terms of the tone and the attitude of the government to sit down and talk to the Senate. Yeah, um, there has been an improvement, but I hesitate to suggest they're good at it yet. Um, <laughs> The, certainly it was... You're so harsh, David. Yeah. And I, I only have the experience of dealing with, uh, with a, a coalition government, so I've never dealt with the Labor in government. But I'm told that uh, in, in the Gillard period, when the House was a minority government and they had to get the crossbench support to achieve a majority, that the relationships with the crossbenchers in the House was very, very positive and very favourable. I've, I've heard some of them say that. You couldn't say that about the relationships with the crossbench in the Senate, um, even now. It still leaves a lot to be desired. Some ministers, and Matthias Cormann, I agree, is a good one. Uh, when he has legislation on the go, he'll talk to you. And uh, Michaelia Cash is another one. She'll talk to you, um, discuss your concerns. You know it's coming. You know why they're trying to do it. Uh, you know when they're trying to do it, mostly, except that they're, they're terrible time managers. And um, so, you know, that, that works in their favour. Um, there are other ministers, and they're primarily ministers in the House, who, who will send you a, an email saying, this is what I want to get through the House. I'd appreciate your support. If you've got any questions, here's the name of my advisor. Please give him a ring. 
And that doesn't work very well. And uh, some of them uh, just repeat mistakes that have been made and other ministers have learnt not to do and they just still blunder in and make the same mistakes. Um, in the previous parliament, in the, in the old Senate, uh, before the last election, uh, Ricky Muir, um, for example, hated being lobbied. Absolutely hated being lobbied and the best way to convince him to support something was to speak to one of his advisers. One day, in fact, he even hid in the toilet so he couldn't be lobbied, uh, so he could get away from, from being lobbied. And yet, um, several ministers knew that and knew exactly how to deal with him and yet others would, would blunder in and try to lobby him. You know, not in the toilet, they, though. No, <laughs> no not, not in the toilet. So, um, uh, you know, they, sometimes they like dealing with me because I'm very clear about my, on my principles. I say I won't, won't vote for an increase in taxes or reduction in liberty. That's an unshakable uh, pair of rules and so if, if, if they can judge their bill against those two parameters, they know pretty much what my position is. But uh, nevertheless, they still uh, are very different. Uh, they, some of them are very, very good and uh, maintain a relationship. Others are absolutely purely transactional. And uh, you know jolly well that uh, once they get an outcome, you'll never see them again. I, I think that winner-takes-all approach has, uh, has changed somewhat. Um, since uh, the Abbott days. Um, but I would agree with David that there still is an attitude of that. And, and unless there is a, a, an understanding that, no, the Senate's job is uh, to look at this to... And, and people expect it. Our voters, the people who vote for us on the crossbench, expect us to take that job seriously, to scrutinise things. And trying to pretend that that is somehow us getting in the way um, doesn't do anyone any good. And do you, does the crossbench, do you talk amongst each other very much to try and, and get a better negotiating strategy when you're talking to the government? Um, not, not exactly that. Uh, we have a, a crossbench meeting room, which the, uh, for, the, for the 12 crossbenchers, not, not including the Greens. Um, and uh, we do have a scheduled meeting time uh, every, every sitting week and uh, most of us either attend or send, send along staffers and we do talk about things of interest. But the truth is we're a pretty diverse group of people and um, so Nick has uh, his, his uh, own party meetings, uh, Pauline has her own party meetings, um, so th th there's nothing to be achieved by, by um, 12 of us getting together and trying to reach agreement. We, we tend to see things in different ways anyhow. So we talk about things that, uh, that uh, w you know, w we can make progress on, procedural stuff, um, uh, th things, w how the government is dealing with you, have you heard, have you got information, that kind of thing. If, if the government's making stuff up, you find out pretty quickly, don't yes. you? <laughs> you do. And Senator Xenophon, do you interact much with your crossbench colleagues? I think so. I, I mean, you know, no, <laughs> don't, don't poke me. Uh, no, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's a very different atmosphere in the Senate compared to the House of Reps. Uh, it is much more collegiate. We have to work with each other on committees. Uh, I think all of us are on a stack of committees and uh, David's uh, chairing one on, on cutting red tape and Sarah's on a stack of committees, so am I. So you have to work with your colleagues and the, the great thing about the Senate process is that we look at issues, if it's a references committee, or look at legislation and try and dissect it and, and do what the Senate is meant to do, to review legislation or to look at some of the big issues um, which ordinarily would not be seen, looked at in the same way by the House of Reps where it's incredibly partisan. Um, we'll go now to some tin tax. We've had government ministers speaking this morning about what they want to do and the Treasurer about his budget. He has to get that run past you guys to see if you like it or not. So I just wanted to take your temperature on a few issues. Uh, first of all, what's been called Gonski 2.0, the government's school funding. Uh, uh, Senator Hanson-Young, you, the Greens were initially seemed supportive, but you now say there needs to be more money. Where do you think you'll land on that? Um, Look, I actually don't... I know that's the way it's being presented, but I don't actually think we've changed our position at all. What we um, said right from the word go was we know that the, the current situation with uh, the 
uh, education funding is isn't a long-term solution. It's not. Um, th there is a funding cliff at the end of this year because the government, under Tony Abbott, um, disgracefully decided to rip uh, the years five and six of Gonski out from uh, that money out from. Um, promised agreements to states. So there's been a funding cliff sitting there for the last four years. We are very concerned about that, but we also want to make sure we've got a, a genuine needs-based funding model um, that is funded. And uh, the current legislation uh, tabled by the government, there are some improvements to the status quo, but it doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere near what David Gonski originally envisaged. So yes, we want more money, but really, Lyndall, can we, how do we justify to kids in poor schools that they've got to wait 10 years before their schools get to that standard? That to me is madness. If this is about trying to fix and lift the level of education in our country, um, waiting 10 years, um, most of these kids in our, in our current system are gonna have finished school by then. And we've just absolutely wasted uh, a generation of um, lifting educational standards, particularly in our public schools. You know, that's where the bulk of our kids get educated. So, um, we, uh, I'm, I'm here on a, a break from Senate estimates where we're currently um, drilling the education department to try and get down to the, the detail of, of the package. But um, it's not, it is, uh, we need more money, we need a better time frame, but we also need the states brought into this process. The federal government can set whatever rules it wants, but unless the states uh, follow through, then we're gonna see rich schools who continue to get more money and poor schools who get left behind, and I'm just not prepared to sign off on that. Senator Xenophon. Well, can I just say, uh, Rebecca Sharkey, my <coughs> uh, colleague in the member for Mayo, that my co our colleague in the lower house voted for the package, but with reservations, um, saying that there ought to be further improvements, subject to the Senate inquiry process and subject to further negotiations. Uh, I agree that you ought to bring forward the funding package. At the moment, it's 10 years. I think uh, eight years would be would be certainly preferable. But I also think you need to look very clearly at outcomes. Um, putting money into something is, is important, but you need to make sure that that money comes with decent outcomes. Uh, there also needs to be transparency in the funding model and also a requirement for the states not to use any additional funding in education as an excuse to back away from, uh, from their funding commitments or their funding obligations. So we'll look at it. Um, it's certainly less contentious than the higher education package from our point of view. Uh, I think it'll get through in some form. Uh, and I've got to say that if, if Malcolm Turnbull happens to win the next election, if you believe news poll, he won't at this stage. Um, the turning point, I think, will be the political masterstroke of enlisting David Gonski uh, to uh, to back your education policy, given that, uh, you know, in, in a sense, it was branded as Gonski, ironically, by the ALP and the education unions, because uh, it was it was linked to him uh, and his name. So, um, uh, pretty clever politics on the part of the coalition. Uh, if you read the Financial Review to, uh, and uh, on Friday, so every second Friday in the um, inside back cover, there's a column by me. You'll find tomorrow I'm writing about this exact subject. Um, my view is uh, the, uh, the funding for schools, well, the, the current the pro government's, propo uh, government's proposal is a slight improvement in terms of the formula. Um, it could be a great deal better. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but they, what they do is for the independent schools, or non-government non schools, they, they collect the addresses of the parents and then um, determine the socioeconomic status of the school based on the addresses of where the parents come from. It's an extremely crude, um, you know, very poor system. And I, it could be vastly improved, and all they'd have to do, in fact, is get the tax file numbers of the parents given to the ATO and the ATO could work out the true SES of, of the schools. Um, in, my, uh, in my ideal world, um, we wouldn't even go that far. What we would do is assign vouchers to, to the kids um, based on the uh, SES of the parents and any special needs, or they're disabled or remote or something like that. And that would then go to the schools, and the schools would be paid on the basis of the vouchers. Um, but, so that's, but that's a fair way from where we are at the moment. Um, will I vote for the government's uh, package? That is an interesting question. Um, 
on the face of it, in, on pure simple terms, I wouldn't because it involves an additional two point something billion dollars in expenditure. In the six months leading up to this, to the budget, the minister, Simon Birmingham, went around saying money is not the answer. We've had uh, substantially increased funding of education for the last decade and education standards have been falling. It's time to think about what we're getting for our money rather than throw more money at it. And I think that's eminently logical. Now, all of a sudden he stopped saying that, he's going to throw more money at it. It's obviously for political reasons. So on the simple face of it, uh, um, I won't vote for any extra spending. We've got a budget crisis, I think. Uh, we've got a debt that's 600 billion heading to 700 billion. We've got a deficit that, uh, you know, we, this year we're going to uh, we're going to get rid of it in four years. Last year, we were going to get rid of it in four years. The year before that, we were going to get rid of it in four years. You know, it's just putting stuff on the credit card forever is just not, a, not an option. So um, uh, the only other, the, the other thing I would add to that is that I am asking the education uh, bureaucracy for some additional information on, on um, uh, aspects surrounding the package and uh, that may determine what my, where my vote lands. But as it stands at the moment, additional funding I don't think can be justified. Uh, the other big item is the question of the hike in the Medicare, le uh, Medicare levy to help fund the NDIS. Uh, Senator Lionhelm, do I presume, because you don't like tax rises, that this is a no for you? Yeah, that's a short answer. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're looking through the detail of, of how this would work, but from a... Um, uh, at first blush, we are concerned at the idea of just a flat rate. We think that um, if we were to uh, increase it, then it needs to be on some kind of progression um, as, as with other types of taxes. Um, and but isn't, isn't it progressive because it's 5%, 5 not a dollar yep. figure? Uh, yes, but that's, that's across the board. And, um, you know, what happens if, if the government decides to increase that, that everyone gets an increased flat rate? Um, so we're looking at the detail, Lyndall, and we haven't, we haven't landed on it as yet. But um, uh, we are also concerned um, about making sure that the NDIS um, is funded uh, properly and that uh, it's not used as a political plaything. These are some of the most vulnerable people in our community. and. Um, you know, all you need to do is turn on question time and just see how um, people in wheelchairs are being, you know, used as political fodder. I think it's revolting, actually, and um, we should all just work out how to fund it properly, get it done, and stop playing with people's lives. So we're still considering our position in terms of whether the Medicare levy should be cut in at a, the, uh, at a higher income. Uh, but one thing that does concern me uh, is what someone quite senior in the disability sector told me the other day and they said that the way the NDIS is going at the moment in terms of the way it's being run and administered and rolled out, it could end up being a cautionary tale for the rest of the world on how not to do it. Now uh, that concerns me. Uh, we need to make sure that the whole concept of the NDIS, no less than the Productivity Commission, uh, said that this this will unlock the, the human and economic potential of people who have uh, disabilities uh, and their families, um, and it's a very worthy goal, and it's a very uh, it's a project that that must be done properly. Uh, but if there are some in the disability sector saying that this is turning uh, into a nightmare, we need to be very mindful of that. Uh, otherwise. Um, money will be wasted and not going to the people who need it most. Yeah just, yeah, just to reinforce what Nick said, I agree. I mean, I haven't met anybody who doesn't uh, have tremendous compassion for uh, disabled, but the NDIS is, has the makings of a massive trough with, uh, uh, with every snout you can imagine sticking it, uh, poking into it. I'm very concerned that it doesn't end up like that. Now, we will open up for questions from participants. While you're <coughs> thinking of a question, remember, raise your hand and the microphone will come to you. Um, I will ask one broader question because part of the role of CEDA is to uh, not only seek improved public policy but improved political discourse. Uh, are you concerned, have you been concerned by what has seemed like a much more partisan, much more hard fought and much more focused on politics and policy state of discussion in the last few years in politics? Senator Xenophon? Uh, look, I think um, 
even though at a personal level I, I get on perfectly fine with him, I think that the benchmark was set in part by Tony Abbott as opposition leader. He was the consummate opposition leader. He would not give the Gillard government a break. Uh, ruthlessly exploited uh, every weakness, uh, every um, every opportunity to score a point against the uh, against the then Gillard government, um, swept to victory in 2013, and then I think that uh, and, and then yeah, uh, it crashed and burned. But as Sarah said, uh, but I think the opposition has learnt from. Uh, from Tony Abbott. Uh, why should we give them a break? The, the, the sort of consensus that you saw in the 1980s, 1990s during the Hawke um, Keating period when John Howard was opposition leader for a while, uh, where they would get through some big, some big reforms through, uh, that won't happen. Uh, it is much more partisan. I don't think it's a good thing. Can I, and I do want to mention one thing. Um, I am going to swear, just to sort of make the point how, I know David does all the time, I try not to in public, <laughs> Um, we're, in, we're in deep shit in this country over energy policy. I've seen a number of businesses in, in recent weeks who tell me their gas bills are going to double. Uh, we're talking about tens of millions of going up in the many millions of dollars. We will see a tsunami of job losses in this country in manufacturing in the coming 12 to 18 months. The impact of, on that on our economy would, will be profound. It's a consequence of a failure of a bipartisan energy policy, a failure of a policy that has led to a failure of investment uh, and a whole range of policy decisions we, we've gone, we've made some serious mistakes. The proof's in the pudding. Gas prices are going to at least double. Electricity prices in the eastern seaboard will go up 20 to 30 per cent for consumers and across the board from July the 1st. It's going to be an absolute job killer and I still can't believe that we haven't, uh, people haven't, um, you know, got together at a bipartisan basis to sort this out because Make no mistake, you will be seeing tens and tens of thousands of jobs that will be lost uh, with those sorts of increases in the gas price. The original question is around, um, you know, whether things are hyperpartisan, I guess, and any more than regularly, um, uh, perhaps. But I, but I also think um, the public is and and the voters are getting sick and tired of, of that as well. You know, we do it to our peril. I remember this time last year in the uh, midst of the 2016 election and we <laughs> kept hearing politicians and political commentators saying, oh, no one's engaged, you know, no one's listening, you know, no, one's, no one cares about the election, as if it was the voters' fault um, that they were not engaged. And I was like, well, I'm sorry, but what are you? What are we offering these people? What are we? How are we engaging people? I do think we need a bit of a rethink um, about participatory democracy and how we engage with people in a in a much more real sense. I think um, the advantage that we have in Australia is we can see what's happened in the UK uh, in terms of Brexit and with Trump's election in the US, and people are angry. They've been told for. Uh, a long time, um, myths about trickle-down economics, they've been told life was going to get better, um, there's been a massive growth of inequality and people are looking over their shoulder and they can see other people doing pretty well and they're feeling that life is pretty tough and politicians for, uh, it, on, from all sides and consistently for, for the last couple of decades have just been saying, oh no, just it, it, it'll get better, don't worry, that's, that's not going to happen to you. We haven't been upfront with people about the changing nature of work and the economy, and I think Nick makes a really good point about the manufacturing sector. And unless we have some truth bombs dropped, I think the public is just looking at politicians and saying, well, you know what, you're spinning and that's it. Um, so I think we're at, the three of us and um, our colleagues on the broader crossbench are in a good position to um, uh, drop those truth bombs when it seems that both the Labor and the Liberal parties are too afraid to. So, so your, your question was, is, is the debate more partisan, you know, more uh, frenetic? Um, and I, I, to some extent I agree with Nick uh, that um, that process began with Tony Abbott as opposition leader never gave the, the then Labor government an inch. Um, and that process is now uh, continuing with the uh, Labor opposition not giving the uh, coalition government an inch, to the point where when the government adopts Labor's policies, Labor still opposes them. And, and the, 
uh, the explanation for that is, of course, that uh, they're both competing to sit on the government benches. And they're very, very close in the polls. Uh, Labor believes they can win the next election. They came close to winning the last one. The Liberals don't want to lose the next election. They came close to losing the last one. Um, and that has an influence on uh, policy. That has an influence on what, you know, what governments say and what oppositions say. And, and we see that in the last budget. You know, you just heard Scott try to put lipstick on a pig. It wasn't a Liberal Party uh, budget by a long way. It was a Labor Party budget. And, uh, and uh, why did they bring a Labor Party budget? They don't believe in, in most of what they're saying because they want to survive politically. Um, and in that context, when it's a very even fight, um, uh, things get a bit frantic. I'll throw open if anyone from the audience has got a question. <coughs> Someone with their hand up the back. Senators, thank you for your time. Steph Elliott from QBE Insurance. Just a general question. Uh, what's your view on whether the government is doing enough to support small, medium and large businesses? Well, my, my answer to that is uh, uh, no, not enough. Um, the uh, small, small and medium businesses in particular are huge employers and uh, the best way to help people really is to help them get a job. Um, once they've got a job then they're on the, the, uh, uh, the, the way of uh, economic independence and, and uh, you know, happy life I suppose to summarise it. Uh, so uh, what would be the sort of things that would help that, from, uh, help that to occur? Lower taxes, less regulation. It's the same old stick that I keep hammering all the time. Less regulation, lower taxes, get out of their way, let them get on with doing what they do and uh, don't throw rocks in their path. Uh, and I am chair, as uh, Nick said, of the Red Tape Committee. We had a smorgasbord of issues to consider. How do we narrow it down to the point where we can uh, rationally approach the subject of red tape? It's just a massive, great pile of it. We are a highly taxed, highly regulated society, and as a consequence, uh, uh, the barriers to business are enormous. Um, I think uh, the government's doing a pretty good job at looking after big business. I'm not sure um, they're doing such a good job looking after small and medium businesses. I, I take um, a different view than um, Senator Lionhelm on this. I think um, uh, lower taxes and less regulation is exactly what larger businesses want to continue getting larger at the expense of small business. And I think um, that's the way it's been for a long time. Uh, when we talk about how um, you know, small businesses being the biggest employers of Australians across the country. Um, that rarely, that only ever gets kind of mentioned by the Treasurer in passing. It's not something that um, is constantly uh, at the front of mind, particularly come budget time. And, you know, it, it comes down to uh, how things work in this, in this building. Um, the influence that is wielded in this building is by the people who uh, have the money and the dosh to hire lobbyists and spend time walking the corridors of parliament. Um, if you're running a small business, um, you're not going to have time to get on a plane and fly to Canberra, and why would you? Um, or even to go in and visit your local MP uh, back home in the electorate. I think um, the level of, of political influence from uh, large uh, corporate Australia and uh, the multinationals uh, continues to grow in this country and um, the the push for uh, tax cuts for for those companies over 50 uh, million turnover I mean that just proves it in my in my book we have to actually have priorities when we come we come to the budget David mentioned before budget crisis well yeah okay so why are we giving 65 billion dollars worth of tax cuts to a bunch of people who don't actually need them um, you know, it does come down to priorities. Small business, I think, has been forgotten for far too long. And uh, if we talk about innovation, we talk about the changing nature of work, which is happening. It's not that it's in the future, it's actually happening now. And uh, we don't have government really engaging on that very practical level. From um, my perspective of looking after both education and young people, 
I think there is so, such um, amazing things and such an uh, opportunity to engage small business in um, tackling youth unemployment. Uh, and we just don't have those, those uh, groups talking to each other. And even from a government perspective, you never hear those groups talked about in, in one sentence as part of an innovation plan. At the risk of sounding monomaniacal, um, I will just go back to the issue of energy costs uh, because at the next CETA conference, um, if, energy, if the energy crisis isn't brought to some, under some control and that we do something about those spiralling gas prices, uh, then you will be, dealing with, will be dealing with a recession, we'll be dealing with massive job losses, we'll be dealing with businesses packing up and leaving our shores. And a lot of businesses won't talk about it publicly, although you've seen from the front page of the Finn, Glencore and other companies just in yesterday's financial review, we're talking about shutting down a, a copper plant, energy intensive with 2,000 employees because of energy costs. Um, if you don't fix that, uh, we, will go, we will have an Argentinian moment. And you know, 100 years ago, Argentina and Australia were two of the richest countries in the world. Argentina went down a path of very bad policy decisions, uh, bad governments and slid into penury, uh, still hasn't recovered from that. We will go down that path unless we sort out our energy crisis uh, in the coming months because we will scar our economy quite profoundly with the departure of manufacturing. And these manufacturers don't want to speak out publicly because they don't want to impact, uh, they don't want their bankers knocking on their doors saying, oi, we've lent, you know, your we're going to call your loans in, uh, particularly private companies. But believe me, there are billions of dollars worth of investment that will uh, become stranded assets because they cannot afford to run their plants with gas prices doubling. Well, we've got you here. Do you have a solution? What? Yes. The short answer is there's a whole range of measures. Um, the government agreed to implement some of them, but we need to have a much tougher use it or lose it policy, particularly for the North West Shelf and the Bass Strait. I know some of the big oil companies don't like that, but there's still plenty of gas there that needs to be unleashed. Uh, we need to have some government intervention in terms of export controls, which is the government will be starting on July the 1st, which I hope will help. Uh, we also uh, need to have an emissions intensity scheme. The great paradox is that Labor opposed it back in 2009, uh, as did the Greens. It was some, because it was an alternative approach, uh, it was something that uh, I co-sponsored with Malcolm Turnbull was when he was opposition leader with Frontier Economics. Now everybody wants an emissions intensity scheme except the coalition, which commissioned the report in the first place. Such is the weird nature of energy politics in this country. Unless you have some certainty in energy politics uh, policies in this country, you won't get the investment we need to solve the energy crisis. I, I, I think um, the key thing there is the certainty around um, uh, a price on uh, carbon. You know, whatever uh, form that is in, the Greens have said in relation to an EIS, and we stand by this: the devil will be in the detail, um, if and when Labor decide to. Uh, really detail their policy or um, if there was some massive change of heart from Malcolm Turnbull's perspective. Um, but it is the price on carbon um, that is needed in one form or another. Any more questions? I think that's a great segue into uh, the question I was going to ask. Uh, Mitch Hook, I used to have a bit to do with energy policy and I'm particularly taken, uh, Senator Hanson Young, with your request for truth bombs. <laughs> And I think uh, the elephant in the room uh, about energy policy, um, and I'd be interested in your comment, is the Trump, the, the fact that ideology is triumphing over market solutions. Yes. Now, before you brand me as uh, part of the carbon lobby, I personally think we need the trifecta. We need a global protocol. We need a price on carbon. There's got to be a market mechanism. Uh, we need breakthrough technologies. And those technology choices, again, should be driven by the market. But what have we got? We've got a crazy situation where we've got state governments regulating and intervening in the market, putting a moratorium on gas, conventional and unconventional gas exploration. We've got a crazy renewable energy target scheme, which is a poor infant industry assistance mechanism. It's a very high cost, inefficient abatement measure, and yet it is adding massive amounts of costs to the prices of energy that you're talking about. So it's actually a very simple solution, and that is you only intervene when there's a market failure. You let the market rip and you take away these subsidies. Josh Frydenberg yesterday told us there's a five-fold increase 
uh, in investment in renewables. Well, no kidding, Sherlock. Uh, that's where investment goes when you've got the feather bit of protection. Senator Linehelm, let the market rip. Yeah, I mean, you know, where do I start by disagreeing? Um, my view is uh, uh, more supply, take the brakes off. Uh, these, <coughs> these moratoriums and bans on coal seam gas, uh, you can't even explore for it in Victoria, for God's sake. It's insane. The uh, United States has retained, in, re, reinvested in its uh, manufacturing industry as a result of having uh, low cost, readily available gas. Uh, they call it shale gas there, but it's only slightly deeper than coal seam gas. And, uh, uh, you know, why are we so smart that we think that we don't need to do that sort of thing? Um, I don't think we should be interfering in, uh, in contracts that uh, exporters have, uh, have signed with foreign customers um, in order to reserve the gas for the domestic market. We should be increasing domestic supply. I do, I do share, though, Nick's uh, uh, concerns about uh, energy, the effect of energy prices on uh, industry and uh, jobs over the next 12 months, two years. I, you know, even if they started building new power stations tomorrow, um, they won't come on stream um, soon enough to prevent high likelihood of blackouts um, next summer and the summer after that and probably the summer after that. It's not going to be a good time for a while. Now, I don't think, um, as Nick also said, the political reality is that it's not, it's not being faced up to, it's not being confronted. There, there, there is no solution on the horizon um, because there's an awful lot of ostrich behaviour going on. I, um, thank you for the question. I, I think uh, one of the most laughable uh, pushes for government subsidies at the moment is a billion dollars uh, to help Adani build a railway in Queensland. And you talk about, um, you know, letting the market rip. Well, why on earth should the Australian taxpayer be having to, to, to put up that kind of money, let alone the fact that you know, we've got the Queensland government now <clears throat> tying itself in knots in relation to uh, royalty holidays? Um, so, you know, there is inconsistency across the board in relation to this, and I guess that's kind of... Um, that's what I'm interpreting from, from your perspective there. Um, the same in South Australia recently in relation to um, uh, Jay Weatherall's announcement for an energy plan in SA. Um, millions of dollars put aside for subsidies for the gas industry. Now, um, you know, gas prices um, are as high as they've ever been. They're getting higher because they're um, pegged to the international uh, market rate. Um, why on earth we have to spend taxpayer money in South Australia subsidising the gas industry is beyond me. I think it's a waste of money. Um, but I also take heart from the fact that uh, when we look at the um, energy space and particularly the renewable energy space, solar and battery storage is becoming very, uh, very competitive uh, it, to a point where um, it is so, uh, so much more affordable. Uh, for individuals, small businesses, larger businesses. And I think um, it's happening already. And it is that kind of disruptive nature of uh, the energy market. Um, I'm a big supporter of making sure we um, set the rules so that battery storage can take um, a larger, play a larger role a, and have a real value in the market. Um, set the rules, create a level playing field, and then, yeah, sure. And I, and I would bet um, that solar batteries and renewables um, will take off even even bigger. I think that's a good thing. Um, but I agree with you that um, government subsidies for industries that don't need it is um, more like pork barrelling um, than anything else. Uh, look, the, the I, I support solar thermal, and um, <coughs> I hope that with the negotiations with the government to, to get an equity loan to a solar thermal plant in Port Augusta, uh, that will have all sorts of advantages in terms of being virtual baseload. But so, uh, battery storage won't, in the short to medium term, solve our immediate problems. I, I despair about the nature of politics in this country. I think that politicians will only come to the party to tackle this head on uh, only once we see mass factory closures, industries leaving the country, uh, and the economy going to recession. I know it sounds pretty bleak, but 
that's where we're headed uh, because this economy cannot withstand the sort of price increases we're seeing and for those companies to remain in this country. And two companies I spoke to in the last week, uh, well over 2,000 direct employees between them, few a th few thousand other people uh, in terms of the, the, the impact they have on the broader economy, uh, they are saying they cannot between them withstand gas increases of $50 million, uh, more than doubling of what they have to pay uh, without it killing their businesses. And I reckon it seems the major parties will only finally act uh, when we see those mass layoffs and when the economy goes into recession. But it's not a shortage of gas, Nick. We, we've got plenty of gas. It's the price. Someone's making a lot of money. It, it's a question of supply and it's a question of the contracts that were signed and it's a question of whether there ought to be gov emergency government intervention to deal with it. All I know is that I, don't, I don't want those manufacturing energy intensive industries shutting down and leaving us because if they leave us, if they leave our shores, they won't come back and the great paradox is they'll go to other countries where the emissions intensity will probably be much higher than it is here in Australia. We've got time for one final question. And there's a question from this side of the room. Hi, uh, my name is Rachel Sloper. I'm the company secretary for Lutheran <laughs> Services. Um, we're from Queensland uh, and uh, we are in the community services and aged care um, industry, I suppose you would call it. Um, heard a lot at, uh, over the last few days about um, economy, markets, jobs, employment. Um, and interesting to hear you talking about the uh, rollout of the NDIS. Um, and uh, Nick, you're also from the state of South Australia where there's been um, a federal inquiry prompted by some catastrophic failures at state-run um, mm. aged care facilities recently. Uh, so I guess where that leaves us in the third sector is saying, well, market mechanisms are useful and we should look to improve them wherever possible. However, uh, there's also a need to reinforce the... Uh, I guess the strength of the community and um, the relationships that people have with one another because uh, uh, the market can never replace those things um, and they're often, especially in the disability and aged care sector, um, they offer a lot more strengths um, than an economic model alone. So I guess my question for you all is uh, what can government do, either a philosophical or practical level really, uh, to encourage more community and less economy. Can, can I just we answer that very... Just have quick responses. Yeah, it, a, a 30 second response. The problem at Oakton, which is a scandal, and, and, and I and my colleague Sterling Griff brought six family members of, of family members who died at the Oakton facility. Some we believe prematurely in the coroner, uh, the state coroner hopefully will be looking at those cases of, of, of terrible, terrible neglect. Um, we need to have more inclusive institutions. That involves greater transparency and accountability on the part of the Commonwealth with their accreditation uh, mechanism, which I think has failed. Uh, it involves empowering residents and their families to get answers. It involves having things such as basically uh, a falls and incidents register, uh, which I think has been lacking in the aged care sector. Uh, but to work with the sector, because it is a growing sector, you provide an incredibly valuable service and I think that unless we have that level of transparency, we'll continue to see failures. And I'm still appalled that the South Australian government uh, um, is still saying that the ICAC inquiry into Oakden for maladministration uh, ought to be held in secret. And I think that th that needs to be held in the open as a matter of urgency. I think that, uh, I, I mentioned before, I think part of the growing frustration of uh, the electorate um, uh, with politicians and kind of uh, I'd, I'd probably put in this the idea of kind of the, the broader um, uh, corporate Australia um, sect is that the community have seen that trickle down economics is bullshit. It hasn't worked. They've been people have been told that all you need to do is let uh, the the market decide, and we'll, we'll you know give subsidies over here to the big players, and um, it'll work its way down. Tax cuts to big companies, and um, everyone will be everyone at the bottom end will be looked after. Well, um, when you talk about the types of clients that uh, Lutheran Services look after, well, that just doesn't come out in the wash, and I think people are waking up to that. What we have to do is find a way to ensure that those services and those individuals are given a genuine real value, um, that it is not just about um, 
uh, looking at a budget uh, sheet every May and saying, oh, this is how much money that sector's going to get. Um, the truth is, and South Australia is a good example, where in their changing economy, we actually desperately need more people working in the caring services. We need more people um, working in, in those uh, service delivery models of, of looking after people, connecting with people, but we don't, we don't talk about those things as a value uh, to the government, to community, um, and we need champions for those uh, in this place as much as in, um, out there uh, in the real world. We need to ensure that when the Treasurer stands up on budget night, he talks about the value of what Australians are doing, looking after, caring for each other and contributing to their communities, not just some red or black line or some false debate about good debt versus bad debt. And Senator Lionhelm, I'll the try. last word. I'll be quick. <laughs> um, I, I think you've got an unrealistic expectation of government. Uh, government in the end is public servants, uh, laws, regulations and courts and, uh, and uh, people with guns enforcing the laws. Um, the idea that you've got, um, uh, you know, that government, all that system can create, um, you know, a caring, loving environment is, uh, is uh, optimistic at best. That these are matters for civil society, for, for us as individuals and our interactions with each other. If we as a society decide that uh, aged care is not being uh, handled well, and I think that's a reasonable conclusion, um, at least to some extent, then we can treat aged pe people who, who need looking after and their families as customers and have um, suppliers of aged care services competing for their business as customers. In the same way we could do that with uh, school, care, school education and we could do that more with uh, patients in healthcare so that doctors and hospitals and whatnot are competing with, uh, for patients on the basis of quality and price, as, as occurs if they're trying to sell us a car or a pair of shoes or something like that. But to, to think that government can make us all nice to each other and, uh, and care and share and all that sort of stuff, you know, I, you're never going to get that. And uh, I don't think that's government, what governments can do. What is the point of government, David? You tell me, you've probably got a better answer than me. <laughs> <laughs> we might, because we've run out of time, uh, leave it on that note. But I will thank Senators Xenophon, Hanson Young and Lionhelm for caring and sharing with us today. We do appreciate your time, but we'll let you get back to the joy of thank Senate you. estimates. Thank you very much. Thank you.